Um, I'm Farrah Griffin, uh, Chair of African American and African Diaspora Studies. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome you to this afternoon's book roundtable. Thank you so much for attending. Um, sponsored by the Institute for Research in African American Studies and African American and African Diaspora Studies Department. Um, and I'm glad you found it because we had a switch in location, so it's um, good that you were able to make it here. Uh, these roundtables are among our favorite events because they allow our faculty and students to engage leading scholars in the field who have produced new and cutting edge work. Um, we've hosted roundtables like this with Princeton University's Imani Perry, uh, who was in conversation with an interdisciplinary group of Columbia graduate students who engaged her work, Vexy Thing, on gender and liberation. We also hosted University of Pennsylvania's Michael Hanchard, who joined a roundtable with our colleagues. Um, oh, good. Is he here? Yeah. Okay. With our colleagues, um, Robert Gooding Williams and Anupam Morale, who discussed um, Professor Hanschert's The Specter of Race, How Discrimination Haunts Western Democracy. Today, uh, we are thrilled to welcome Professor Theory Pickens, um, the author of Black Madness, Mad Blackness, which explores the connection between blackness and madness. She writes that she aims to architect a series of conversations that retool our theory and praxis for and about the black mad and the mad black. Um, professor Pickens is currently Associate Professor of English at Bates College. She received her undergraduate degree in comparative literature from Princeton University and her PhD in comparative literature from UCLA. Her research focuses on Arab American and African American literatures and cultures, disability studies, philosophy, and literary theory. Her first book, New Body Politics, narrating Arab and black identity in the contemporary United States, asks how does a story about embodied experience transform from the mere anecdote to social and political critique? Her critical work has appeared in a host of critical journals, um, and she has also published in the groundbreaking collection, Blackness and Disability, Critical Examinations and Cultural Interventions, as well as the critical volume, Defying the Global Language, Perspectives and Ethnic Studies. Professor Pickens is also a creative writer. Her poetry has appeared in Squaw Valley Journal, Black Renaissance, Renaissance Noir, Save the Date, and Disability Studies Quarterly. Her drama has been performed at the New Jersey State Theater. We last hosted her in March of 2015 when she presented a talk titled Feeling Arab and Black, Conversations About Race and Disability in Literature in our Works in Progress series. And I'm really thrilled to have her back with us today. Um, I'll just say that in reading this book, I was struck by so many things. I, I learned so much, but I was most um, especially struck by form, uh, the form itself, uh, which is um, extraordinary and unique. And, and also, I think, the form models a way of thinking. And this book teaches us uh, new ways of thinking. It teaches us to rethink um, as well. And after reading it, I found myself wanting to go back, as a black feminist critic in particular, to texts um, that I'd read but will certainly read differently now because of what the work that's presented here and the way that it teaches me to read and think. And I was thinking these are works that aren't mentioned here but that will benefit from the way of reading and thinking offered here. So I was thinking anything anything by Ntozake Shange, <laughs> but especially Lillianne and the Four Colored Girls, which is up at the Public Theater, but also um, books that we thought we knew, like Morris and Sula, or Morrison's home. Um, and so I, I thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to rethink some of those things. We've selected a wonderful group of colleagues to be in conversation with her this afternoon. And in the interest of time, I will, um, I will introduce them briefly and in the order in which they will speak. Oh, and I should also say, I mentioned um, sponsors for tonight's events. The Columbia University Seminar on Disability, Culture, and Society is also a co-sponsor of this, um, this afternoon's event. 
Samuel Roberts is the former director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies and associate professor of history and socio-medical sciences at the Malman School of Public Health. He writes, teaches, and lectures widely on African American history, medical and public health history, urban history, issues of policing and criminal justice, and the history of social movements. His first book, Infectious Fear, Politics, Disease, and the Health of Effects of Segregation was published by UNC Press in 2009. Um, and he is now also, he also worked on the um, publication of a widely read landmark report titled Aging in Prison, Reducing Elder Incarceration and Promoting Public Safety. He's currently researching a book on the history of drug addiction policy and politics from the 1950s to the present, a period which encompasses the various heroin epidemics between the 1950s and 1980s, therapeutic communities, radical recovery movements, methadone maintenance treatment, and harm reduction approaches. So um, that's Professor Roberts. I'll introduce C Professor Baswell so that he can just jump right in when he gets here. Um, professor Baswell is Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University and the Anne Whitney Olin Professor of English at Barnard College. Before joining us here at Columbia, Professor Baswell served as the Director of the Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies at UCLA. His earliest research was in the reception and transformation of classical literature, especially narratives of empire and dynastic foundation in the vernacular cultures of the European Middle Ages. His first book won the 1998 Beatrice White Prize of the English Association. Further work on foundation narratives has led to articles in a forthcoming monograph on narratives of female foundation and their challenge to dominant tradition of founding fathers. And in, addi in addition, he is also at work on new research on the cultural imagination of disability in the Middle Ages. Uh, professor Yosef Soret is associate professor in the Religion Department and the, and the uh, African American African Diaspora Studies Department here at Columbia. He also directs the Center for, on African American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice. Professor Soret is an interdisciplinary scholar of religion and race in the Americas, employing primarily historical and literary approaches to the study of religion in black communities at, in the United States. His first book, Spirit in the Dark, A Religious History of Racial Aesthetics, was published in 2016. His second book, The Holy, Holy Black, The Ironies of an African American Secular, is forthcoming also from Oxford University Press. Elizabeth Donaldson uh, is from the New York Institute of Technology where she is Associate Professor of English and where she teaches courses in bioethics and American literature and directs the minor in medical humanities. She has published essays on LSD-inspired disability immersion experiences of schizophrenia, mental illness in film, anti-psychiatry in Lauren Slater's memoirs. She chaired the Modern Language Association's Committee on Disability Issues in the Profession and she is a fellow in the Future of Disability Studies group at Columbia University Center for the Study of Social Difference. Um, she co-edited the essay collection, The Mad Woman and the Blind Man, Jane Eyre, Discourse Disability, and currently co-edits the book series, Literary Disability Studies, um, and a number of other publications. And I should say, we also had invited black feminist scholar and theorist Jennifer Nash of Northwestern University, who sends her regrets that she's unable to join us, but she too is very excited about this extraordinary new publication. So the way this evening will work is, um, first, first, Professor Pickens will give an introduction to um, the work, say a few comments about her goals and the intervention she hoped to make. And then each of our speakers will speak um, about the, pro the, the, share their thoughts, engaging aspects of the book, the argument that most resonated with them, including any questions they may have for Professor Pickens. Um, and then she will respond to their comments and we'll open it up to a conversation with the audience. So thank you. And I think we'll start with Sam Roberts. And, oh, no, theory, right? Theory. Yeah. Uh, am I on? OK. Um, <clears throat> thank you, everyone, so much for, uh, for coming here today. Uh, first, I'd like to thank those whose labor often disappears from these spaces, the staff, um, 
uh, for an event like this to run really smoothly, these folks ensure that the, de the details are done just right. Um, and I want to take a moment to thank them for their hard work, all the folks doing AV currently, um, all the folks who mic'd us up, the facilities and janitorial staff who opened up the space for us, along with uh, Sharon Harris and Sean Mendoza uh, for all of their hard work in getting me here, as well as our interpreter. Um, so I just want to uh, start with a note of gratitude for them. Uh, usually I have access copies. We couldn't make that happen for you today, uh, so I do apologize for that. Um, and uh, if you were on Twitter, um, that is another mode of access if you feel like you can engage there better. Um, and for those who will eventually be seeing this or who are already engaging uh, right now, um, Twitter is a, a useful space for me to, to kind of keep some of these conversations sound as bad. Is that what you said? Sorry. OK. Oh, well, Twitter is an, a lovely place for us to, um, to engage after as well. Um, so um, I had to write this down, or I thought I might get uh, a little waylaid by how emotional this is. I want to give a big thank you to the folks who've graciously agreed to read my work and provide their thoughts. I deeply appreciate their sacrifices of time and labor. It's a small book, um, but because I'm a poet, every word is doing some work. Um, I was told that someone had to drink several cups of coffee to get through one chapter. Um, which I'm not entirely sure is complimentary, but it, I, I did appreciate the, the, um, the concentration they were willing to put in. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure, really, to be here, and I feel very humbled to be a part of these conversations on paper and in person and digitally. A, very also, a big thank you also to uh, Dr. Farah Jasmine Griffin for her work in putting this together. Um, I remember when I got into graduate school, uh, Professor Cornell West, who was my uh, thesis advisor, sent me to Dr. Griffin to prepare me for what lied ahead. Um, and he told me, sort of very characteristically while smoothing out his beard, uh, you know, Sister Pickens, if there's any sister I know who can tell you how to do this thing here, right? And he paused, it's Sister Farah. <laughs> so I came up here to see <laughs> Sister Farah. <laughs> I uh, made my way to New York City, took the A train um, for the first time. I'm, a, I'm from New Jersey, so usually we come into Penn Station and we grab a cab. Uh, we, don't really, we don't really mess with the train, <laughs> the train system. Um, I climbed all of the stairs, uh, got lost, uh, and ended up in her office. I ended up with a, a copy of Uptown Conversation, uh, the edited volume with Brett Edwards and Robert O'Malley, and uh, a copy of If You Can't Be Free, Be a Mystery, which was uh, one of the inspirations for this book. Um, we listened to Olita Adams together. It was a great time. Um, <laughs> I also left really buoyed by her um, generosity of spirit and her warmth. Um, I feel like, I felt like at the time I could do what uh, was coming. And it's not without some small degree of bewilderment that I, that I find myself here today, um, due in large part to her magnanimity. And for those of you who are uh, word geeks, right, magnanimity means great soul. Um, and so I just want to put those together for her. Um, today is uh, November 12th. Um, my uncle, Malcolm, Dewa Malcolm Dwight Scott, would have celebrated his 68th birthday. In addition to being a superb uncle, honest, protective, comforting, wise, he was also a founding member of the Lifers Group at Rahway State Prison in Rahway, New Jersey. As part of that group, he was integral in the 1978 Academy Award winning documentary, Scared Straight. And thinking about the genesis of my own ideas regarding blackness and madness, I recall that he was one of the first people to tell me how complicated the performance of madness could be. I was maybe five or six, and my mother told me that I was not to let anyone, not even a member of my own family, pick me up from school if they didn't know our secret password. Um, my mother I used to work for uh, DIFUS, I believe it's called ACS over here, um, Division of Youth and Family Services. We were very, very clear about safety. Um, and this was one of the rules that we had. Um, <clears throat> so my uncle Malcolm had been deputized to pick me up one day and he forgot the password. Um, I have always been a stickler for rules, uh, and so I would not go with him. He was not one to be undone by such things, and he did not tolerate my refusal. He picked me up and hoisted me over his 6'3 shoulders and carried me like a kicking, screaming sack of potatoes all the way home. 
And when he finally set me down, he looked at my crinkled, tear-stained little red face and asked me, now who taught you to act this crazy? You know I don't need a password. It was my first lesson that madness could be strategic. When I was in graduate school, a second year law student physically assaulted me by pulling on the back of my scooter and punching me in the face. My Uncle Malcolm was there again to offer a few choice words of advice, including to tell me, use your pen. Tell everybody that needs to know, go crazy. My second lesson. And today I offer up these words in his honor and in his memory. I just wanna to pause to take a small moment of silence. My second monograph, Black Madness, Mad Blackness, had one specific intellectual aim, bring together disability studies and black studies. I wanted to theorize about how we think when we think about blackness and madness together. I turned to madness specifically because of its wide lexical range and its messiness as a term, its simultaneous reference to anger, sanity, and excess fascinated me and seemed a feckin' space given the Academy's reliance on a particular kind of beautiful mind. This meant that I wasn't just interested in the material realities of black mad folks, I was also interested in how these folks understood how they knew what they knew, that is their epistemology, and how these folks understood being themselves in the world, that is their ontology. Since I believe in the words of Barbara Christian, the people of color theorize in the everyday in puzzles, riddles, plays, and stories, I thought there was no better place to look than the narrative theorizing of black speculative fiction. My work looks to the artists, theorists, Octavia E. Butler, Nalo Hopkinson, Tana Nareev Du, and Matt Johnson for how they unmoor realist worlds from time and space. In so doing, their created worlds reveal much about the machinations of the unsettling ideology that so architects the world we inhabit. Following Barbara Christian's logic, I honor the fact that creatives are often theorizing as critics are playing catch up. These artist theorists trouble the way that we have heretofore understood blackness and madness together. Namely, they frustrate four main ideas. So what follows is not really meant to be a summary um, of the book, but these four ideas are the kind of main threads of the conversations. First, they upend the idea that blackness and madness are mutually constituted by suggesting that mutual constitution usefully functions as a historicizing tool and highlights some moments of agency for black disabled folks, but cannot fully or even ethically account for the interracial encounter. For one, the historicizing approach does not account for the way that black folks often exist, of, often exist as objects of history, occupying space while white subjects determine time. The recourse to resistance ignores that in this paradigm, the black mad operate again as objects, this time as tools for white liberalism to acquire its calculated and critical cultural release. Second, they clarify that blackness changes your perspective. It isn't just about the magnificence of the melanin. It isn't just happenstance. We are not all kin underneath the skin. Blackness is a way of knowing, being in the world that is structured by various institutions. So when madness is a black thing, with all the echoes of objectification and exclusivity, the understanding of madness changes, it shifts. Third, mad blackness questions how we understand the very concept of the human. Both black studies and disability studies question the way the human as we understand it currently comes from a Western Enlightenment project one that has as its foundation anti-blackness and ableist ideology. These artists, theorists force us to ask whether we need this concept as is or whether it is worth destroying. Fourth, as all creatives must, these artists, theorists arch their eyebrow at form, specifically the novel. They make it plain that the novel accepts blackness and madness as, sorry, they make it plain that the novel that accepts blackness and madness as subject positions as valid ways of being and accepts those two as aesthetic interventions must, by virtue of that acceptance, call into question the possibility of endings. The only way out is through. To that end, if you want to come through, you can, okay. You're gonna come around, okay, perfect, all right. 
So um, I look forward to hearing what my colleagues have to say about the ideas within the book, but for now I want to concentrate on some of the details of the book's structure and its design, why they mean what they mean, why I made certain choices during the publication process and the writing process. It's kind of a few um, Easter eggs, if you will. First, the covers, plural. The design of the front cover is Lorna Simpson's enumerated. It's comprised of ink and screen print on clayboard. It features nails in a hash mark pattern of five, four in a row, and then a fifth nail crossing the other four. I chose this image because it speaks to the looming specter of the carceral system for black mad folks. And in thinking of the carceral system, I include the prison, the jail, the penitentiary, yes, but also the places where people are forced to mark time, like the foster home, along with the number of foster homes and parents, the asylum, the hospital, the rehabilitation facility. These places and the desire to mark time within them is a way of making steady what feels unwieldy. The cover becomes a marker of the desire for control and the difficulty of having it. The second cover, uh, Wangechi Mutu's Riding Death in My Sleep, is ink and collage on paper. It features a bald woman crouched on a round surface with mushrooms and various fauna at her feet, an avian creature atop her head, a flying elephant in the top left corner. This cover occurs at the end of the book, um, right after the, the last words. Uh, it's a provocation, a suggestion that so-called conclusions are not possible, or perhaps even undesirable, since sleep and death might be commas or semicolons rather than full stops, a statement echoed in the book itself. The cover itself is a mixture of black, white, and gray. Um, so this is, I mean, oh, it's, it's up there. Okay, great. Um, the orange is Princeton University's official Pantone color, um, or as close as the press could get to it. Uh, this is, of course, intended as a nod to one of the spaces where my mad blackness uh, flourished. Uh, the personal is political. Um, I think, you know, what might become fabled is that it's a kind of shade throwing to Princeton. I didn't mean it that way. Um, but I do think that some of the conversations in the book might actually support that claim. And as someone who critically reads often without caring what the author intended, I will accept that particular interpretation. <laughs> um, I designed the book to be a series of conversations. They could feasibly flow from one to another, kind of echoing the tracing or the mapping desires of a traditional monograph. But they also could, should, be read as overlapping discussions they refer back to each other, revise, augment, and sometimes may contradict each other. This still serves the primary function of the book to get us to think about how we think when we think about madness and blackness. In terms of method, this allows my project to abide in, foster, and participate in the kind of messiness that a study of blackness and madness requires. I am fond of telling my students that the class, the 12 to 16 week term in its entirety, is meant to function a little bit like an extended dinner party. So uh, that allows me to tell them to be polite to each other and you know, to save space, um, et cetera. Um, but that also means that the conversations are ongoing, and so is the case with the book. My expectation is that the conversations will not be enclosed arguments, units like chapters, but rather elliptically open possibilities for us to continue discussing in good faith. And as with any good dinner party, there's always sidebars. So the footnotes and the epigraphs operate here with my particular kind of scholarly quirk. I use them in this writing similarly to how I've used them before, and that I expect them to do a substantive amount of work in pushing the conversation beyond the four walls of the text. Often as critics, we're disciplined to read and write such that we bury the labor of research and conversation in the footnotes and privilege our own voices in the prose. This is a useful strategy for presenting a more traditional argument, particularly one that has to uh, stand up to the conditions and the requirements of something like tenure. Um, but my project here is wayward. It's something you can do uh, once you have tenure, um, or if you, you know, <laughs> choose to flout the rules beforehand. Um, but my wayward project here requires that the footnotes and epigraphs differently participate in and shape the conversation of which they are a part. I choose my epigraphs from black women's poetry since they push the debates in new directions, hint at possibilities. They are when and where I enter. The footnotes are not solely explanations of sources and methodologies, but they also signify, 
joke, pun, turn of phrase, explore. Both the footnotes and the epigraphs are asides, witticisms, and musings, and probably a little bit of, um, a little bit of shade, uh, particularly with some of the people that I was told uh, by my reviewers that I needed to include but didn't want to. Um, so I would you know, put them in the footnotes and have, have many a commentary about why they didn't really need to be there in the first place. Um, but these all expose how certain voices and ideas move through my work here and later could move through another scholars. I invite folks to theorize from above and from below. Hear the words of my uncle reverberate. Use your pen. Tell everyone that needs to know. Go crazy. Thank you. Right, thank you. All right. <laughs> Is my microphone on? Can everyone hear me okay? I check one too. All right, fantastic. Good evening. Um, I also would like to begin my comments with thanks to Farah and to Iris for the invitation to uh, join in this, I'm going to call it a celebration of work well done in, the, in a wonderful book and, and a book that will have so many lives, not just in the many fields to which uh, to read, participates, and contributes, but I think it's going to go well beyond that. So I hope you're prepared to get emails from all over, <laughs> sector, probably sectors you probably not, may not have even anticipated. Um, my favorite times of year are holidays, graduations, and book launches, and I feel like my holiday is beginning early with this particular book celebration, and I do not have to wait for graduation. So thank you so much for this. Um, there is so much going on here. I don't know who it was that told you they needed several cups of coffee to read a chapter. After I read each chapter, I felt like I had drunk several cups of coffee. There's just so much stimulation going on in each of these. I don't think I read any of the chapters in a linear fashion at all. I ended up kind of hyperlinking myself through the footnotes or the end notes and through different concepts that link each other. It's a uh, I guess your, your history as a poet explains the economy of words that you use here. It is, uh, when you pick the book up, you're surprised that it's, if you would expect it to be heavier after you have read it. It is so much going on in there, and it's such a rich generative text. So thank you so much, and congratulations to read. Just um, some of the things that I pulled out of the text, and in particular, there, there are many innovations that she's doing here. Uh, narratively and methodologically. First of which, the one that's most striking is how she organizes, and I'm trying not to say arguments because she's, I think, trying to get away from this classic uh, genre form of the chapter. And instead she presents her case, shall we say, um, which also sounds a little bit stiff and stultifying, um, and for what she calls conversations. And so in the first, which, which she's titled, Making Black Madness, and by the way, the, the title itself, congratulations on that. Um, the, I know there's some story about how you came to that, and I definitely want to hear that origin story. Um, and each of the, the conversation titles are no less uh, appealing and intriguing. In Making Black Madness, Pickens concerns herself with the mutual constitution of race and disability. How, as she puts it, these two discourses operate as interrelated and simultaneously present. To take it further, she, quote, reads the spaces where the critical material breaks open the possibilities for new readings of blackness and disability in tandem. But as she just mentioned in her opening remarks, it's actually more than that, and it's not quite as straightforward as one may hope, she warns us. First, and this is another quote, blackness and madness encounter the problem of existing on the same temporal plane, particularly when whiteness is a factor. The black mad subject gets evacuated from history while the white able subject or white disabled subject dictates the terms of history's narration. Second, and this is continuing the quote, second, black mad subjects cannot always serve as the prompts for others' freedom from ableism. It is possible for black individuals, institutions, and cultural spaces to be ableist. Moreover, when black spaces function as examples of freedom for others, they do not exist on their own terms a logical concern that lands us back in the terrain where whiteness instrumentalizes blackness for its own ends. That ends the quote, even though that, I'm, that will not be my last quote here. There are so many rich quotes here. And in short, and at the end of it, Pickens asserts, within the United States, and again, I'm sorry, another quote here, within the United States cultural zeitgeist, there is no blackness without madness, nor madness without blackness. 
yet the discourse's fragility suggests that the two have been forced together out of political convenience and presumed abjection, end quote. This is her opening salvo in this piece here and automatically sends the reader on, on a, a, a journey of sorts where you're not quite sure where it ends. And not to, I guess, a bit of a spoiler alert, Tariq doesn't do endings, by the way. Like she just says, we just continued this work, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. For in the second conversation, a mad black thing, which another thing I didn't know you could do, you could <laughs> use the word thing in your title like that. Now I want to do that. Um, Pickens concerns herself with the idea of madness itself, a term she deploys, quote, because of the critical possibilities it offers in its vagueness. It operates as a way to describe impairments such as cognitive disability or mental illness, as well as a catch-all phrase designed to reference those not behaving according to culturally prescribed norms. And as she mentioned um, in her opening comments, about advice, sage wisdom given to her by her uncle. Sometimes we all have to act a little mad in order to make our, our assertions uh, known and to make, actually to make ourselves visible and legible. Here she confronts, among other things, cultural constructions of madness in the context of blackness itself. In a classic disability studies framework, madness, she reminds us, can signal cognitive impairment, which would read, say, autism, Down syndrome, traumatic brain in injury, dementia, et cetera as well as mental illness, where she also points out the examples of bipolar disorders, depression, schizophrenia, and other spectrum um, conditions of the mind. The distinctions between the two are particularly important in what Pickens describes as a black cultural context. A black cultural context, she writes, quote, mandates a different set of interpretive strategies because of the confluence of structural racism from the outside and its impact on the intracultural community and structural patriarchy and ableism emanating from within the community. Parsing, and this continues the quote again, parsing mental illness and cognitive disability allows for a certain type of granularity when discussing black cultural context and madness. The importance, that ends the quote, the importance resides in what, val what valences madness carries in black cultural production. And here she returns in each of the chapters to the, the form of the novel. There's a tension here, of course, since in the first conversation, Pickens argues the mutual constitution of blackness, even where that constitution as an analytical frame may have its limitations, and also disability madness due to white, um, I'm sorry, mutual constitution of blackness and disability madness due to white ableist cis heteropatriarchy, and you could try saying that five times, um, whereas she invites us in this conversation to think differently in how madness as an idea, a trope, or even a claimed or unclaimed identity might emerge or function in black subject formation itself. There's something deeply unsettling here, and I mean deeply and literally unsettling, because Pickens enjoins us to move beyond what Harry Ellum theorizes as racialized madness. Our job is not simply to push back on the pathologization of black minds and bodies, because doing so, even under the banner of disability critique, puts us perilously close to a so-called recuperative politics of madness, um, I'm sorry, madness without the multi, and this is a quote, I'm sorry, madness without the multidimensionality that accompanies embodiment or aesthetic intervention. In short, madness in service of sanity, end quote. If you've become used to defending black folks against all manner of white social science libels, claims of functional normality come ready at hand, and it may be, as I said, literally unsettling to find yourself challenged to think about black madness on its own subjective terms. If you're wondering if such madness in service of sanity is a neuropolitical iteration of respectability politics, you're not alone. And you and I both, I hope, will have the opportunity to ask our invited author to elaborate on that a bit. In the third conversation, Abandoning the Human, Pickens takes up incitements provided by Sylvia Winter to question the utility of humanity as a basis of analysis. In short, the question might be, what good are humanity and rationality if they, as Enlightenment projects, cannot really have come to being without their opposites, both the black and the mad? In her reading of Kimberly Juanita Brown, Sadia Hartman, Christina Sharp, Hortense Spillers, and Alexander Wahaley, among others, she charts in this light an always present objection in enlightenment and beyond depictions of blackness, even as disability theorists themselves often have embraced humanity in their own analyses. Pickens isn't just moving between both, but offering her own theorizations as a connective tissue. 
mad blackness for her questions the, quote, ideology of ability. And, and that, uh, that's a quote because it's, it's actually a, a term with which she engages throughout the book, um, or a concept, <clears throat> the ideology of ability that so often attends concepts of the human, but also links that, she also links that to the possessive investments, which are part of whiteness itself, going back to George Lipset's work from some couple or more decades ago. The links are, again, at times unsettling. To use another quote, how is one defined as a citizen if madness or blackness functions as a default to disqualif disqualification? End quote, she asks us on page 80. <clears throat> and an answer asserts, again another quote, mad blackness calls for no less than a retooling of the terms of humanity itself. This is truly unsettling work in the most literal uh, sense where we, what we have settled ourselves in our comfort in thinking about what is humanity and how we make our plaints, um, both ideological, political, and intellectual, clearly may come up short in uh, Therese's formulations. In the final conversation, titled Not Making Meaning, Not Making Sense, S-I-N-C-E, -E, clearly I take it a pun on making sense as well, um, and then in parentheses, the end, uh, the end, um, the time, Pickens brings us back to narrative to assert the vital value of the novel as literary form. The novel emerges, she writes, as one fecund place to explore the relationship between meaning and value, since it's, it is a genre where the mad black and the black mad have traditionally occupied complicated positions. And the complexity and complicatedness of this is, is, is resident at every page um, of, this, of this work. To continue another quote, two questions drive uh, her curiosity here. First, how does it shift away from abjection as a primary meaning of blackness and madness transform the value of each? Implicit in this question, she writes, are can it and will it? But also second, how does the black novel form and tradition intervene in changing the meanings of mad blackness and black madness? Ending the quote. By way of answer, Pickens directs our attention to the work of novelist Matt Johnson, and this is again a return to narrative. Indeed, each of Pickens' conversations concludes with a discussion of the novels of Octavia Butler, Nalo Hopkinson, Tanana Reeve Du, or Matt Johnson, whom Pickens takes as theorists, Pache, the approach outlined, and Barbara Christian's essay, Race for Theory. Now, I'm not going to say, I'm going to say at the outset um, that I'm not a literary theorist at all. I don't even play one on TV. <laughs> And with the exception of Octavia Butler, the novelists whom Pickens discusses are known to me only by name and popularity. I'm, you know, it's unfortunate I'm um, uh, embarrassed to, to have to admit that. This is unfortunate for me as I'm certainly missing out on something, even though Pickens' discussions of these works are engaging even to someone who is unfamiliar. Fortunately and very appreciably, however, Unfamiliar readers can still navigate Pickens' methodically structured conversations to extract their critically suggestive meanings. The way she's doing so much here that's, that's so innovative methodologically and in terms of the genre itself, but there still is, and I'm, I, I, I wanted to say a method to the madness, all, which yeah, so, um, yeah, it, was un, it wasn't intentional, it just came out, that was just, yeah, in any case. Um, and Pickens leads us on a whirlwind tour or we might say more of a journey. The feeling of being led on, on such a journey might stem from her use of the genre of quest adventure speculative fiction, or her embrace of Afrofuturism, or simply because any discussion of madness for the past, I don't know, two or three, four hundred years or so, often seems to invoke some sort of movement. Think, for example, one's quote, you know, descent into madness, or Ian Hacking's uh, famous Mad Travelers, or the proverbial Ship of Fools. And here I want to get to a section which I'll just call what's in it for me, which is to say what I've taken away from this and how this has deeply influenced how I think about my own work. <clears throat> of course, the question what's in it for me is usually a challenge, a demand for some sort of compensation for effort expended. That's not, of course, what I mean here, but instead use it to signal my deep appreciation for the effort Pickens herself has expended in staging such a bold intervention. So many of Pickens' assertions and suggestions offer promise for how I think about my own work. Indeed, to read Black Madness, Mad Blackness, is to encounter one of those books that makes you strongly suspect that, either, that each other reader's encounter 
with this book is as singular as your own. I just had, a, I just had an image as I was reading this, uh, that like riding on a subway train, and on a subway car, and looking around you and seeing everyone carrying a copy of this, and knowing that each of them had a different experience uh, with it. Um, but all just all having that feeling of having drunk a, two, a couple too many cups of coffee and just having their brains racing at a, at a mile a minute. As a historian of science, technology, and society, who began his career specializing in late 19th to mid 20th century medicine and public health and racialization, <clears throat> I spent most of the past decade moving myself to the post World War II period. In particular, I've concerned myself with the politics of race and what we used to call addiction rehabilitation. I myself do not use the word addiction um, and, or rehabilitation for that matter for other reasons which actually are not very much germane to this panel. Um, but in any case, I've concerned myself primarily with the uh, previous heroin epidemic of, epidemic of the 1950s into the 1970s. It's a challenging project necessarily made so that I have set, made so because I've set before myself the task of explicating addiction as a historical construct, sorry, whose meanings and reference are always assembled in large part from those of the historical construct of race. Just to take one example, post-World War II mainstream US political discourses have framed both blackness and addiction as forms of dependency and dysfunction, and really a case of madness in itself, right? The topic of black drug addiction has never been remote from discussions of black matriarchy, black failed citizenship, failed black gender enactment, enactments, black indolence, black cultural deprivation and deficit, the black damaged psyche, et cetera, et cetera. If you're thinking of the Moynihan Report of 1965, so am I. Not because Moynihan was particularly insightful, he certainly wasn't, or even intellectually creative, he definitely wasn't. He cribbed all of his uh, his insights and dumbed them down from other social scientists. Um, but nonetheless, he had great uh, influence uh, well beyond and even till today, we're still debating that report. Like all the allegations Moynihan and others before and after him leveled against the black psyche and the black family, the 20th century concept of addiction did not emerge only in teleologically from medicine, but rather from popular culture and social scientific imaginaries as a way to make race even more concrete and to make blackness itself legible. For us, it's never been a simple, us meaning us black folk, it's never been a simple medical or mental health issue, or at least that is not the, a political or social science narrative of which we've been able to avail ourselves. And we see that even today in the contemporary opioid crisis. Historically, in fact, the phrase black addict has been discursively redundant. The social science has forced onto blackness the same odious attributes which has forced onto people who use drugs. For this reason, it historically has been rather easy to bribe, to bribe both of basic rights, since dependency, irrationality, unchecked desire, and failure are all as essential to each its historical construction as they are antithetical to what the liberal idea, the ideal of the proper and deserving citizen has been. That said, the question for me has been, what are the political and subjective possibilities for a black recovery, even when in our recovered state, quote unquote, we remain in positions of assumed failure? And this is where the, the mad blackness and the black madness has for me offered some answers. Until recently, um, I haven't really engaged very much with the disability studies literature, mainly for the reasons which made necessary the intervention staged by Tariq Pickens, by Christopher Bell, by Dennis Tyler, who I think I saw walk in a little while ago, um, by Ellen Samuels and others. As Pickens puts it, the analogical argument that disability is, quote, like race, misses opportunities for nuance and leaves plenty of room for suspicion. At the same time, formulations of addiction as disability I found similarly wanting because they've been completely absent of theorization of race. I think I don't have to wait any longer, and now I have not just a wonderful book to guide me through this journey, but also some of those wonderfully uh, innovative and stylized endnotes that you place in there. And I did see some of the shade on it as well. Um, as some very appreciably well-placed Michael Jackson lyrics yes. as well. So Tariq, congratulations, and thank you so much for this work. Uh, I really, I look forward to reading it again and again and to offering it in the classroom. And I know it was gonna pop up in some very unexpected places, so congratulations, thank you. Hi, Mom. <laughs> the family's here. Yes, yeah. my family's here. The family is here, well, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Um, so, uh, I believe I'm next. Um, good evening, everyone. I um, want to follow both Tree and uh, Sam uh, in beginning with 
expressions of gratitude to Professor Griffin and uh, for the invitation and for the uh, community, the staff and team, Sharon and Sean, as well as the broader community at IRAS and uh, the new department for the invitation and all the work that went in uh, to making this conversation possible. I want to thank my colleagues on the panel uh, for the conversation. And most of all, I want to thank Professor Pickens uh, for this book. Um, and um, it was so clear in uh, Professor Roberts' re remarks, the, the conversation that is both the model and the call, right? The conversation that the book engenders. Um, so I, I guess a few things that I would uh, hi hi highlight as a way of celebration, acknowledgement, and then uh, after doing that, what I want to do is focus on one particular theme um, that maybe is in the book, but following the book's invitation is around the book and is as much about the field and the kinds of interventions you make uh, in unanticipated directions, right? This, um, and that those will, in many ways, um, help to locate me as a scholar of religion, uh, as a uh, signpost to where I might go. Uh, so first, I just want to applaud uh, the degree to which the book masterfully thinks together the fields of black studies and disability studies, right? Often a contribution is through a discovery of new materials, um, in the archive or in the field, but uh, the just as arduous work of reading across uh, multiple fields to have them speak together um, and to speak in ways that open up whole new fields of study. Interdisciplinarity is a buzzword, but the level of labor that goes into that um, is often not recognized in the degree to which this book brings black studies and disability studies into uh, an exciting and rich conversation is to be applauded. Uh, in addition to the interdisciplinarity, uh, I want to also highlight the power and persuasiveness of the uh, attention to the normative co-implications, if you will, of bringing these fields together, uh, right? The, this interdisciplinary effort is not done in a naive form with a, a, no sense of the implications of bringing together a conversation uh, that is attentive to the ways in which disability studies as a field has been racialized, often to the absence of black bodies, and, and when blackness and black studies as a discourse uh, has often been premised upon the need to prove, right, ableness, right? There's a sort of question around black people's capacities and the degree to which uh, Professor Pickens attends to these normative implications in subtexts or often explicit texts um, is powerful and helpful. Um, to restate the, the, the politics uh, and what's at play in, in the field today. And then also um, alongside the interdisciplinarity and the persuasiveness of the normative critiques is just the insightfulness of the readings as uh, she moves us from the field to these novels, to these texts that in ways that are both sharp and poignant, generative for new possibilities and then um, in many ways, just fun, right? Which is to say the, the playfulness, not just of the reading, but the form of, its, of the book itself that opens up um, and is a refusal of closure, right? Calls attention to those folds in the spaces where possibilities have been closed <clears throat> off and insists on opening them up for new conversations. So insightful, generative, playful. And I want to, in many ways, take a cue um, as the core of my response from the book's refusal of a familiar form of linear in a linear model of uh, argumentation and follow Professor Pickens' call for formal modeling of an invitation to a kind of intellectual openness and conversation, which is to say an open conversation. And to do that, um, very briefly, just want to bring together two possibly unrelated assertions in the book. At least they're not explicitly uh, brought together, but I think that there is a, a, a lot of promise here. One comes from the final pages where uh, Professor Pickens reminds us and pushes us uh, to the ways in which uh, a particular reading may exceed the boundaries of a text, right? And invites um, us outside of the text into a space in which blackness and madness are seen as integral parts of history, right? The play between the literary and the, his and the historical here. Um, and then uh, this, this refusal of a closure at the end of uh, the printed book, we'll call it, um, and, and a quote at the beginning, um, where on page Roman numeral seven, uh, no, 12, uh, in the preface, uh, Professor Pickens writes, and this is, I was, I've often been told, I think, 
uh, first told this uh, when studying for qualifying exams in the PhD, that one ought to always start and finish with reading the acknowledgments, right? That you learn just as much about the contribution of a text by the genealogy that's traced in the, in, in the introduction. We've got to hear some of that in uh, your own genealogy through Professor West and Professor Griffin. But I was, I was struck by one particular comment on, on this page where you write, quote, I am humbled daily by my faith walk, the overwhelming love of the cross. Um, and I'm wondering, I guess the, the core of my response, which is an invitation to conversation that I think the book invites, is around the play between theory and theology. And I think in my own uh, department, my, uh, a colleague of mine has written about, um, without wanting to confuse, the balance or the, the difference, the very clear difference between analyzing and practicing religion and insistence that theory and practice uh, are more closely related and that theory, quote, is considerably more theological than most critics are willing to acknowledge, right? Uh, and so what I'm asking about is the presence or absence of what you name as faith or what, what might exist under a variety of rubrics and thinking about the fields that are central to your inquiry. Um, and uh, to do that, I want to actually read um, two quotes from theory, if you will, or the thoughts on theory within the context of black literary studies and black feminist literary studies, and then move to a uh, text a little further away. And so first here, I'm thinking of uh, Houston Baker's classic essay, Belief, Theory, and the Blues, where he writes as follows, quote, faith may be conceived, I think, as an effective disposition toward the symbolic that serves as a ground for belief. If faith is indeed the evidence of things hoped for, the ensign of things unseen, and he is of course here quoting scripture, although it's not cited as such, uh, it is still not without symbolic resources for holding the unseen in the mind's eye of the believer. Belief and theory meet precisely at this place of such symbolic resources. Metaphor is the ground, that is to say, on which theory and belief meet. Baker continues the movement from metaphors of possibility to possible explanatory metaphors is a journey from belief to theory. And so I think the degree to which black madness, mad blackness uh, is a metaphor of possibility or, and also functioning as an exploratory, explanatory metaphor, I might ask. Uh, but then I also think of the rightful suspicion or skepticism, and you cite uh, Professor Christian, Barbara Christian's classic essay, Race for Theory, in your work. Um, and I think of, her, think of that essay as well, which is very much mobilized against a particular model of theory, and part of her critique of theory is precisely for the reason that it seems to be very theological. Right, where she writes, because I went to a Catholic mission school in the West Indies, I must confess that I cannot hear the word canon without smelling incense, that word text, immediately brings back agonizing memories of biblical exegesis, that discourse reeks of metaphysics forced down my throat in those courses that traced world philosophy from Aristotle through Aquinas to Heidegger. It is this tendency toward the monolithic, the monotheistic, uh, which worries me much about the race uh, for theory. Um, a very warranted critique, and perhaps, like if, we're, if in the text you're thinking both around, uh, in the genealogy of black feminist theory, Barbara Christian on one hand and Kimberly Crenshaw on the other, the degree to which intersectionality stops short of adding yeah. religion as a fulcrum of the asymmetries of power. Um, what about that absence or presence in the field of both black studies and disability studies? And uh, what I want to do now is read from an entirely different text. And it may be familiar to some of you. Um, and then I'll explain it after as we, in thinking about uh, the presence or absence of faith in black madness or mad blackness. And this is uh, an invitation to maybe a primordial scene of black madness or mad blackness. Mm -hmm. Quote, it was out of the country far, far from home, far from my foster home on a dark Sunday night. The road wandered from our rambling house up the stony bed of a creek past wheat and corn until we hear dimly across the fields of a rhythmic cadence of song. Soft, thrilling, powerful, that swelled and died sorrowfully in our ears. I was a country school teacher then, fresh from the east, and had never seen a southern Negro revival. To be sure, we were in not perhaps as stiff and informal as they in Suffolk of olden time, Yet we were very quiet and subdued, and I know not what would have happened those clear Sabbath mornings had some, someone punctuated the sermon with a wild scream or interrupted the long prayer with a loud amen. 
And so most striking to me as I approached the village in the little plain church perched aloft was the air of intense excitement that possessed the mass of black folk. The sort of suppressed terror hung in the air and seemed to seize us. A pithy, quote, a Pythian madness, a demoniac possession that lent terribly, terrible reality to song and word. The black and massive form of the preacher swayed and quivered as the words crowded to his lips and flew at us in singular eloquence. The, the, people bemoaned, the people moaned and fluttered, and then the gaunt-cheeked brown woman beside me suddenly leaped straight into the air and shrieked like a lost soul, while round about came wail and groan and outcry in a scene of human passion such as I had never conceived before. Of course, this is the first paragraph or two uh, from Du Bois's 10th chapter uh, of the souls of black folk of the faith of the fathers. And there's very much... Uh, clear encounter between North and South, uh, between two different kinds of black folk one might see. And if souls is about many things, about a formulating of a particular kind of differentiated and disciplined, right, much of which you are resisting, refusing, and critique. And certainly the image of faith, what Du Bois refers to as the frenzy, is not what I hear you gesturing towards. Um, yet all the same, I think about the in ambivalent inheritance right, of what kinds of faith, um, where and when they figure in the field as a fold, as a closure, but also as a space of disruption. In fact, the only other place uh, in souls where the fe frenzy figures um, so prominently, and I'm keeping in mind here that the fr this frenzied dimension of black hyper-religiosity -re was read both as a product of suppressed anger, right, that could only be channeled through religious expression, uh, but also as an outlet <laughs> uh, necessary in the face of being driven mad by Jim Crow, if, we, if you will, right? Um, how do we think about faith, absence, and intersectionality as an ambivalent inheritance for the field? And when I turn to this powerful quote at the beginning of your book, it's not uh, with a sense of uh, asking for an affirmation of faith or an explanation, but is in fact thinking about the work as a piece of black feminist criticism, the professional and the personal that you bring together here, because I think it invites, uh, in one of the ways in which mad black, black madness, black madness could be read is not as a statement of faith. It's certainly not a call to hope, right? You resist that, mm -hmm. um, but as a form of testimony within sort of black literary and religious traditions, as you bring together the literal, the metaphorical, the history, and the literary, the one place else where soul, in souls where the frenzy figures is in fact in the, fission, in, in the fiction, right? In that one chapter of the coming of John where John's hopes are brought to a not so happy resolution in a church service, right? Where John's ser sermon or his speech falls flat uh, the welcome party has gone awry and a old unlettered black preacher rises to affirm the frenzy as the one principle of Negro religion uh, that perhaps is believed in the most in Du Bois's, rev um, in du Bois's uh, rendition of this story. And so I, I guess as a, as a way of uh, thinking about Christian's question, for whom are we doing what we are doing when we do literary chrism? How do we think about this ambivalent inheritance of faith, the faith of the fathers? How might faith be figured uh, in the particular genealogy of black studies and disability studies that we inherit today? Um, thank you again for that invitation. Um, and I'm excited yeah. to continue that conversation. Um, hi, uh, I'm Elizabeth Donaldson. I have some very brief remarks. Uh, I just wanted to echo what a, um, a lot of my panelists have said about, uh, about um, the book and uh, thank you to everyone who has um, helped bring this together and make this happen. Um, one of the things as a, a feminist scholar of disability studies of mental health and as an Americanist, um, I'm cognizant while reading uh, Terry's book of how kind of linear I am and linear my thinking is. And so reading black madness and mad blackness, and I'm still 
hanging that title right around in my head, was really <coughs> this kind of challenging, mind-expanding type of experience. It really has that hypertext type of feel to it when you're going back from the, the, the epigraphs and the, and, the, and the footnotes. And thank goodness I wasn't in a footnote, right? <laughs> right <after this. laughs> but, um, but what I really loved um, was this idea of kind of folding in, of, of taking disability studies and black studies and talking about um, um, how, how race circulates in disability studies and how disability studies, um, disability circu circulates in race studies and kind of um, putting them together, folding them together like that, creating these gaps and these folds. And, it, and the, just the form of the book itself was this nice, radical, eye-opening um, uh, thing compared to the way I usually think, which is, right, as being an Americanist, uh, kind of heavily invested in his, his, you know, placing things in historical context. Um, it, and, you know, I, I get pushed toward the linear. And what I found fantastic about this book is what it gave to me, right, as a historian. There was still, like you said, right, this, this way in. Um, I had this different different reading. I'm like, oh yeah, the 1840s, you know, senses this thing, you know, all of these things that I kept coming back to and finding as touchstones that helped me navigate my way, way through this thing that still resisted, right, um, right, the kind of linear thinking that I'm more apt to do. So it was um, it was really uh, refreshing and challenging. And I just want to say that I truly appreciate the 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 intellectual labor that went into this, this methodology chapter, it really is, is stunning. You can tell it's, it's a little book, it looks concise, but, but man, right, it, it, can, it can punch you, right, because it has that, that kind of um, heft to it, it has that kind of, there's, a, there's heavy lifting, right, going on, and especially that methodology chapter that I um, deeply appreciated, and I found it especially fruitful. Um, so, as, as I said, I'm not going to go on too long, but I just wanted to um, echo my, my great love of this idea of madness in service of sanity, which I, I know I'm going to come back to um, again and again. And in particular, um, um, Therese's dis discussion of the, 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 the mad black figure becoming a kind of societal bellwether and how that um, um, put that figure in the service of some kind of, um, um, some kind of social explanation of madness that the, the subject itself resisted um, or, or couldn't you know, be so easily contained by. And so I, I, I thought this was, was very, um, very interesting and very fruitful um, to me. I, I love the way that, that form is itself um, this, this mad black black mad thing that is, is not going to um, um, rest in the way that a normal, um, normal text does. Uh, I, again, I don't want to go on um, too long. I'd really like to, to hear um, what Tari has to say in response to some of these um, amazing respondents here. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, okay. Wow. <laughs> uh, there's a couple things I, I guess I, I can answer. Um, uh, and I'll start with uh, Samuel Roberts' comments. Um, so the slang, right, uh, mad black thang, um, I, I love playing with words. Um, there was a time when I used to hate the first day of school because I knew for sure my name was going to be mispronounced. Um, but all the mispronunciations give me a sense of what I'm doing, right? To, re, to read uh, the mispronunciation theory, mm -hmm. theory, right? Um, that, that all of those give me something to work with uh, in terms of how I'm thinking. And so slang becomes a part of the project in, in some way to, to help get the writing done. Um, most often when you are writing, uh, even if you are at coffee shops or even if you are sitting in front of a screen where someone's staring back at you and it's your writing time, you are doing that on your own. Um, and so something about it has to be fun. And so there's, there's something in that wordplay for me. 
Uh, also, as someone who was born in the 80s, raised in the 90s, right, very different from being born in the 90s, um, I'm not Cardi B's generation, right, I'm Beyonce's generation. Um, that idea of having mad as a, as a place of excess, mad dope, mad cool, um, that that was also how I was thinking about some of this. So the slang, um, the gesture toward common language, the language I speak in, uh, was really important for me in terms of the theorizing because either you believe Barbara Christian or you don't, right? Either you believe people theorize in the everyday or not. And so there is something about um, playing with that that was really, um, really lovely for me. Uh, a lot of the footnotes are also about things that I thought I should be able to say, but couldn't put above the fold in the text. So I wrote a lot of this while in my mom's apartment, and there's always Michael Jackson playing. And so uh, the footnotes to want to be starting something and um, the whiz, right, that those are, those are in there because that's what shaped my thinking, right, along with Stevie Wonder. Um, along with South Soul Orchestra and Lolita Hathaway, right? Um, so uh, the tension, say, between mutual constitution of the first conversation and madness in a mad black context, um, it's not as simple, I think, as the tension between interracial encounter and intraracial encounter. It's not just that mutual constitution simply doesn't work in the black-white encounter and mad madness in a black context has its own valences. Mm -hmm. To me, this is about an ethnic and an ethic uh, proposition for how we understand what mad blackness and mad, what mad blackness, black madness can do. Uh, that the choices that I've made to interpret are about skill, right? You have to learn how to close read. Um, and I think that's something that uh, we, we sometimes take for granted when we hear an interpretation that that doesn't require work, it does. Um, but also that it's a set of choices, right? You choose to believe the mad black figure in a text or you don't. Um, you choose to believe the black person in the text or the mad person in the text or you don't. So when you read, say, Jane Eyre, right? If you are looking at the mad woman in the attic, that's a very different reading than if you are not thinking of her as, as, as having a valid subject position. Um, my other favorite example to use, quite frankly, right now is Downton Abbey. Um, the first opening shot of the, um, of the series is a man's legs and his dog. The entire first season is concerned with the valet and his inability uh, to uh, perform normative walking. Right? and what that does for the liberalism of Lord Grantham, right? and whether they keep the valet on board. Spoiler alert, they do, but uh, it's not without this sort of hand-wringing about how liberal Lord, uh, Lord Grantham is. Um, and for me, the choice to believe Mr. Bates is the name of the valet, uh, or the choice to recognize Lord Grantham as magnanimous, right? um, is, is it, I think, an ethical choice. Uh, the choice to believe the disabled character and their own epistemology. Um, I love the idea of neuropolitical gestures as, res as a new respectability policy. This is really, really evocative for me. Um, it strikes me that the... I, I got that mainly from your, for reading your work, so I'll, I'll take credit for it. I love it. Um, there, there's, there's something about the recourse to, um, to smartness, right? Um, and I say this also as like, someone who grew up as a little black girl who was praised for being smart, right? I'm um, praised for being a writer. My very first essay, I was like published at five. Um, like I'm like, yes, that's my thing, I'm smart. But also knowing that that discourse mm -hmm. is in many ways fundamentally disruptive for those who do not have access to it or those perceived to not have access to it. I opened up um, the space by talking about my uncle, Malcolm Dwight Scott, who, um, is, was intelligent, deeply intelligent in his own right, but because of his particular experience in the prison system was not deemed so, right? And so thinking about the way that all of that functions um, and being wary, suspicious of the kinds of um, interpretations that are foisted upon one, mm -hmm. um, I think is, is, is useful, like usefully unsettling to be suspicious of that. Um, I, okay, so the provocation to think through 
that moment and the acknowledgments. I was not expecting this. <laughs> Usually everyone glosses over that part. Um, but I, I think, um, so my faith is a kind of mainstream Protestant Christianity. Um, and I have found that there's very little room mm -hmm. in some mainstream theological texts. Um, mm. Maxwell, Piper, right? even, my, <laughs> even my favorite, Tim Keller, right? that there's, there's very little room to kind of consider where blackness and madness reside. Um, the fact that Jesus was called crazy, uh, the fact that parables conceal and reveal, as, as someone who's interested in language, that speaks to me very deeply. Mm -hmm. um, but also, there is a symbolic reservoir there um, about the way that there's room for everyone um, and that the symbolic resource there for me has consistently been the, I think, equalizing factor that my faith walk offers me. Um, that there's always something to improve upon. Um, there's always a space to go to. Um, and then I think about the ways that, pe that practitioners have not made that space available. So I'm very much invested in the critiques of womenist and queer theologists who um, mm -hmm. pinpoint that mainline and mainstream Christianity has not always been a welcoming place for those considered other. Uh, even though the theology itself, I think, makes room there. So I think there's something about that Barbara Christian skepticism mm. of uh, that, those metaphors and that praxis that bleeds into how I approach my work, that my, my sense of the ethical responsibility of taking people seriously, taking them at their word, or taking them at whatever constitutes words and speech for them, right, because there are some people who are nonverbal, some people who don't use speech in the ways that we all find um, useful, right? And that way, I'm, I'm stumbling over words here, but there's a, there's a texture here to using, say, taking people at their word, when what I really mean is taking people at themselves full stop, right? Mm. Um, that, that I think there's an ethical proposition there. Um, and so that's, that's where my faith comes into the actual doing of the work um, and the actual space of the work to make room, to open up, to practice, I think, uh, what it calls for. Um, let's see, uh, I do believe theory is, theory and theology is more critical than people imagine. I think if you are um, not at all clear about where your spiritual provocations come from, you do find yourself in a little bit of a quagmire with the work that, that you're doing. Um, and I wouldn't go so far as to say it becomes dishonest, but I do think that there is a, a utility to interrogating where, that, where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other part of it, and this is something that's occurring to me now, is um, the idolatry of the academy, the worship <laughs> of a certain kind of mental acuity and capacity that when someone loses their identity or finds that identity of being a scholar in jeopardy, um, that God is fierce. Mm. That God claps mm. back, uh, forces them to become small, mean-hearted, unkind people. Mm. Um, and there's something I think about the, idolatry, the idolatry of ability, and I'm, I'm using the particular, um, uh, that particular term very deliberately based on the provocation here, but there's, there's something about that that also is a party to the ideology of ability, the weddedness to it, and the, um, the inability to relinquish it when it's, when it's not going well. Right? Um, so there's, there's something about that uh, as well. Uh, the coming of John has always perplexed me. Mm. I appreciate your reading of it. Um, the, the frenzy in there as an affirmation of a particular kind of black life, um, and, and madness as a, as a valid response to, uh, to Jim Crow America uh, is, is, I think, worth exploring. Um, I'm not gonna do it, but <laughs> <laughs> someone should. Um, it may end up in a class and not in a paper. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, resisting linear thinking um, and doing a lot of the work in the uh, methodological chapter so I was told um, when I was finishing the dissertation that a lot of your introduction, this is something Helen Deutsch told me, she's, um, she's my advisor along with 
Dennis Tyler, our advisor, wonderful person, told us that the introduction is basically explaining what you're not going to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I took a lot of time <laughs> to try to tell people where I was coming from, um, in part because there were certain questions I didn't really want to answer anymore. Mm -hmm. um, why are you looking at madness this way? Uh, why is the 90s part of your definition of madness? Well, because words have all the history and meaning accrued to them. Um, and so mm -hmm. if you live through the 90s and you ever heard mad, right, that that's what it means. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, trying to, trying to figure out how to um, put people into these conversations. Um, and then this is the last comment I'll make uh, about the um, sort of in response to open it up to questions. The thinness of the book was a very deliberate choice. Um, uh, my good friend, Shanna Benjamin, um, she and I talk a lot about the way that people get lazy about or around black studies and disability studies. They think because they see it, they mm -hmm. understand it, because their uncle, sister, cousin, brother mm -hmm. had something, they get it, they spend some time in a hospital, they understand, that's not true. Um, it's not true for black folk either, right? <laughs> um, and the, uh, the phrase that we use uh, as the catchphrase touchstone between the two of us is that people get lazy about our shit. Mm -hmm. And I wanted folks to understand uh, that the thinness of the book means that there are other people who wrote before me, there are other people who will write after me, there are footnotes you need to pay attention to, there's an entire bibliography, an index, right? These things are not incidental. I didn't pay for someone to do the index for anyone to ignore it, right? Mm -hmm. Subvention costs come out of my pocket, right? So there's something about the, um, the idea that the thin book suggests rigor by itself. Mm -hmm. And I'm following a little bit in the, the um, footsteps of uh, Sharon Holland and Alexis Pauline Gums and Alexander Wahelia who have thin books, mm -hmm. um, all of which are from Duke Press, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> shout out my label mates. But, <laughs> Um, there's something really useful about the thin book because it gives you a sense that there's, there's wealth in the field and that one needs to pay attention to that. Um, the economy of words is, is one thing, um, and I think a very important thing to me, but, but the thinness of the book in terms of not having longish chapters, right? and there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes you need that, but this was not the time and place for it. I think the thinness of the book should also be a message. Um, method in the madness, so to speak. Hmm. Um, I'm really interested to hear what everyone else has to say, so open up to questions at this time. So yes, we'll open it up for questions and I can, I can so that the panelists don't also have to worry about um, picking questioners, but thank you so much for this uh, conversation and we're curious to hear what you all have to say and think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More dirty. <coughs> okay. Oops. Yes. We want it to be free. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah, so Samuel Cartwright also appears in the book. Um, the particular diagnosis that he offered for uh, blacks wanting to run away was drapetomania, um, suggesting that the cure was to cut off a limb uh, in order to make that not happen. So let's pause there for a minute and just kind of think about the ridiculousness of 19th century medicine for a minute. Um, anyone who ever tells you medicine's objective, you can point to Samuel Cartwright and, and talk about that, um, along with J. Marion Sims and others. Um, the final conversation of the book, the final printed conversation of the book, that is, uh, talks about how Matt Johnson's characters desire freedom and are considered crazy for doing so. Um, and that's part of how I understand their madness um, and their blackness working in tandem. What Matt Johnson does as an author is validate those subject positions. So all of those folks who desire freedom 
um, those black folks in his book, The Desire of Freedom, uh, he says that makes sense, right? Um, and in fact, his graphic novels do this a little differently than his more traditional novels. Um, <clears throat> all of them have uh, as their as their protagonists uh, men who who desire freedom um, and who work to get it while having to deal with what um, what discourses surround them, people thinking they're crazy. The one that comes to mind, I think most readily is Papa Midnight, uh, which is an intervention into the Constantine series uh, where um, that particular superhero um, is reinvented uh, without its um, anti-black leanings from other iterations of the comic um, to talk about that person's intervention in uh, struggles for black freedom like the um, 18th century Manhattan uprising of black folks with um, arson, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I mean, absolutely, that's part of what's at work here in the title, um, the, the recourse to 19th century medicine that does a disservice to, uh, to black folk and that, that also gives us a sense that these are, these are long histories um, with which we're working. Thank you for that comment. I've always wanted to open a restaurant and bar called Drapetto Mania. <laughs> you just run away after your work. <laughs> I think you'd sell out here in New York. Yeah. Um, I, I might have some. Uh, yeah. like, I was wondering um, about silence yeah. in, uh, in here, because, and you kind of um, touched on it briefly in, in one of your comments. But, um, and in particular, your, your reading of uh, Quamina. I, in, I think that's how you say it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So I, <laughs> I, it, it just got got me got me thinking about um, um, about accessibility and also about um, subjectivity and agency. Yes. And uh, and I wondered if you could uh, talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. And so the, the questions about silence and and what uh, where silence appears in the in my text and then also. Uh, what some of my other thoughts are about silence with regard to black madness and mad blackness. So a couple of different folks shaped my thinking on this. Um, Lyndon Barrett, um, Kevin Kashi, hmm. Erica Edwards, and Danzy Senna. So I'll start with Danzy Senna since she is the creative. Um, in her work, You Are Free, and in her work, uh, Symptomatic, the characters are often very silent. Um, and this happens in Corrigadora as well. Um, Gail Jones is Corrigadora where the, the characters are being confronted with these strange questions about their personhood, about the traffic between their legs, about their, um, about their choices, and they respond with silence. Um, and that perplexed me, in part because, as I said, I'm from Beyonce's generation, and so the clapback and having the last word, this is also sort of a family trait, desiring to have the last word. Um, <laughs> having the last word is, uh, is something you strive for because that closes the argument, right? If you can shut it down effectively, you can move on. However, there's something about the way the silence also shuts, that argument, shuts those arguments down or at least gives us the provocation, and this is where Kevin Kashi and uh, Erica, Erica Edwards and Lyndon Barrett come in, it gives us the provocation that blackness does not always have to be loud and expressive, um, and that part of the radicality of not embracing what these discourses offer in terms of invalidation, um, that, that quiet can function to do that. Um, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Darlene Clark Hine also says um, similar, makes a similar gesture with uh, the culture of dissemblance where mm. you think you understand what's going on on a black woman's face or in her body, but you don't. Mm. Um, that where you, where you assume much about her interior life, that's not offered. Um, and it's not offered deliberately. Um, I think uh, one of the phrases that I grew up with was, you, you don't know me. Um, and you know, I don't take these people home with me, right? About folks at work. So there's, a, there's an idea um, or Toni Morrison's father telling her, right, you work there, you live here, right, that there's a, a sense of um, moving with silence um, and, and being comfortable in that silence, allowing that silence to do some work um, as a way of saying, 
blackness is not loud always. Blackness is not provocative always in the ways that, that it needs. It's not the, you know, neck moving, finger snapping, finger wave, that kind of thing um, that, that, that folks expect. But there's something I think too, and in the discussion about Kwamina, who's a character in Nala Hopkinson's work, in that moment, she's a neuroatypical character. And I, I'm a little blasphemous here. Disability studies doesn't really like diagnoses uh, when we do close readings, and for good reason, right? Often they don't serve a function. Um, and black studies doesn't like pathology. Pathology, um, For good reason, it doesn't really serve a good function, right? Um, so when I talk about her as neuroatypical, I talk about her as possibly cognitively disabled, one of the things that I want to point out is that she is depicted as someone who doesn't uh, use language the same way that the other characters do. And what I think the novel does is validate that as a, as a mode of existence um, and as a space from which she can um, exist. Um, because she doesn't, she doesn't get any more interiority than any other character that's not the main character. Um, and she also doesn't get invalidated by not having that kind of interiority. She is considered on par with all the rest. Um, so there's, I think there's something very useful about narrative silence as drama, but then also useful about uh, silence within, exposing silence within critical literature as a way of saying what, you know, black is, black ain't, kind of. Mom. Did you say mom? Yes. I didn't tell you. <laughs> this is my mom. I am mom. Aww. I am Therese's mother. She's my one and only child. Special. This is my sister and my brother right here. He's hiding under the hood. So based on the remarks you were just making, mm -hmm. and someone who works in academia for 19 years, yeah. I, I heard you mention in your remarks about Uncle Malcolm. Yeah. Who incidentally is birthday today. Today. Yeah, they know. Right? <laughs> so could you talk about the use of people in this particular book that have nothing to do with academia mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. your use of, of Uncle Malcolm in particular yeah. around that issue? Because <clears throat> I think what you said about him was very profound. It gave me another look into him because you know you have a more famous uncle <laughs> yes, I do. than Uncle Malcolm, um, who some people may or may not know, and I won't mention his name here. Do you, you want me to? You can in your okay. remarks, okay. but someone who's more famous, <laughs> more famous than right, him yes. for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. But you talked about the use of people who have nothing to do with academia, that if you came across them in the context of this narrative that mm. you've created here, no one would know who, who they are or what that means. So could you just elaborate yeah. on that further? Yeah. Um, I'm telling you, I'm not asking I understand. you. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I understand. Uh, so the uncle that my mom was referring to is James Akwe Scott, um, famous for boxing from within prison walls for the title. Mm. Um, mm. And, um, so uh, there's a lot of folks, I think, uh, that help shape the book that, uh, that the book's not written for, mm -hmm. right, if that makes sense. So this is the book that I wrote for other academics and for people who don't talk to the folks that influence me, right? Um, and for the specific reason that I wanted to, um, I wanted to do some explanatory work in spaces that those folks wouldn't get to. Um, and I am also, I think, pretty clear that my activist work is, is in some ways constrained and curtailed by the spaces to which I have access, uh, which include the academy uh, with all of its foibles. Um, but uh, the folks that, that shape the book are folks who decidedly um, <clears throat> wouldn't necessarily pick this up. Um, and they include people like my uncles, <coughs> excuse me, and other members of my family they also include people like my best friend who spent time in a foster home um, and who has, uh, as a souvenir, a particular Converse sneaker, uh, which she's marked all of the foster families that she spent time with. 
um, and it goes into the double digits, um, uh, the high double digits, actually. Um, and I think about the way that uh, those folks are often studied and talked about in the academy with no degree of compassion and no sense of their cultural context. Uh, one of the other things my mother mentions is she's um, in, her name is Lori Scott Pickens, by the way, her name is not mom. <laughs> um, and she has her um, undergrad degree from uh, Montclair State, uh, at the time it was college, now it's university, and then also a graduate degree from Rutgers University and works in the School of Criminal Justice. She is the community liaison between all local, state, federal law enforcement and community constituencies at the School of Criminal Justice at Rutgers Newark. Um, and has been a community organizer, mover, and shaker for the past several decades. Um, so her understanding of the academy truly shapes mine. Mm. Um, and the fact that there are people that the academy talks about and studies, takes their data, takes their biometrics, um, and uses them for reasons that are, you know, I wouldn't, some of them are unsavory, some of them are self-serving, some of them are merely selfish. Um, and some of them, you know, operate on a range between being completely useless um, and often violent, right? So there's a, there's a utility, I think, in having something in print for scholars that says, okay, so there's some ethical issues to what you do, and there's some um, utility to um, maneuvering differently in the world. Uh, that when you have, say, folks using uh, biomedical information, um, or talking about, like um, Professor Roberts talked about the, the contested terms of addiction and rehabilitation, um, or even talking about faith communities in certain kinds of ways, that you have to um, put them in context. You have to understand the traditions from which they come. People aren't just kind of getting up and speaking, um, or not speaking, or appearing in places without context. One of the things that I think is very true about white cis heteropatriarchal supremacy <laughs> is that it is an aggressive form of amnesia. Mm. And so it requires a, a historicity to flourish and do its dirty work. So the less you remember about the times that come before, it's not that you're just doomed to repeat history, you're doomed to create the violence that history has already created. And so this book intervenes in the spaces where I think some of the folks that I'm talking about don't have access, mm. um, but it also is profoundly shaped by their presence, by the validity of who they are and what they do. Um, and so that's, that's, where, that's where much of it comes from. Mm. Yes. <laughs> There's a hand here. Just a minute, the microphone is coming. Hi, I'm very much looking forward to reading um, Black Madness, Mad Blackness. Um, I wonder if you could talk about where you saw the holes, uh, the fault lines in mm. disability studies that um, you hope this book fills or illuminates or okay. however you want to put it. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, this is Simi Linton. She's also one of the people who helped me think through uh, this book. There's, she has a really great chapter in uh, reclaiming, I'm going to butcher this, reclaiming disability? It's claiming, actually claiming disability, claiming disability for the first time. Yes, <laughs> um, claiming disability. There's um, a list of questions that she, uh, she, she gives us uh, particular professions, um, like travel agent. Right. Um, and then has a list of questions about the way travel agents should or could interact with disability. Um, I've used this as something within uh, my classes to get people to think about the practical implications of uh, the literature we read. But here, um, it was a set of questions that I wanted to ask myself about how we can, um, how we can engage. And so with regard to that, the fault lines for disability that I talk about um, are, are multiple, um, and I'll, I'll go backwards from the, from the bottom of the book to the, to the top. Um, not invoking Drake, although by saying not invoking Drake, now I am. <laughs> um, the, uh, the third conversation takes up the way that disability studies seems to gesture toward the human as a useful concept 
just one that's excluded disability. So um, disability studies seems to suggest that the human is a concept we, we ought to embrace, even though, um, and, and that it would all be better if uh, it included disabilities. So that's one of the fault lines I find. Uh, the second chapter excludes uh, white conceptions, white-centered conceptions of disability, um, because often it is as though uh, the black folks in disability studies where they appear um, are appearing as though they are part of a, um, not part of a black community. Um, and I wanted to open up the places where blackness, where madness exists in black contexts specifically. Now this is a little difficult. There's no context in the US where you are outside the parameters of white supremacy. And so finding a black context is um, a little difficult. It's also the reason why I turned to science fiction because Nalo Hopkinson creates that world for us. Um, but yeah, that's one of the, one of the spaces I find uh, that, that needs to be opened up. The first conversation is also um, disability studies, embracing the phrase and the methodology mutual constitution. Um, I find it useful as a way of describing what happens in history around disability and race and gender in the 19th century, sort of how all of these discourses come to be, what we now know as disability, race, and gender in the 19th century, that all arises at the same time as, um, as Ellen Samuels has usefully pointed out. Uh, but um, the historicizing tool doesn't fully account for how they exist in intimate spaces um, where uh, say disability and race compete in someone's imagination for how to interpret someone. Um, and those are the fault lines. What I wanna say about the methodology as a whole is that I'm borrowing from Hortense Spillers who anticipates Deleuze um, and her understanding of the fold and the flesh of blackness as a space of critical possibility, but also a space where things get lost and stuck and where narrative and history turn inside out. So Fred Moten uses the, uses the term intersuscepted or invagination where the whole functions like a cosmic black hole where you can go in, you can go out, you can get lost, et cetera. Um, and then to think of um, the fold as a, as a cut in history, a space where history and literature and narrative uh, get mired. So the, those are the specific fault lines of disability, but I think disability studies and black studies where they meet, because there's so much useful tension, there's some unnecessary tension, mm -hmm. um, they're, that they're, they create these gaps and folds and deferrals of time, and there's some mistakes, and those were the things that I wanted to read. So the book, um, the chapters are actually, or the chapter, oh, the conversations, which I have to get out of my own uh, linearity as well, uh, the conversations have uh, what, what you're not supposed to do is a set of a reading of critical literature. Um, and I talk about the spaces where critical literature, and this is where my friend Timothy Lyle deserves some credit, where it reveals itself to itself um, and where critical literature doesn't do everything it could. Um, and not ever to talk about critics as you didn't do the project I wanted you to do, but more like, here's what your project does, and in light of this new information, there are other things we can, we can talk about. Right. So those are, that's where the fault lines are and where the, where the holes are. Yeah, thank you. Um, just in response to that last yeah. Comment. One of the things I picked up on um, in your third conversation, I think, about the human is you have that sentence, um, you say, both strategies for engaging the human have merit. Um, find, trace, find the traces of what and who is used to constitute the concept and underscore the processes by which the human creates itself. And then you talk about um, common, that there's room for common conceptual ground as well as useful disagreements between the two fields, which I thought was so generative. But let's thank um, this wonderful, wonderful round table and go out and buy the book, and I think it's <laughs> gonna teach you how to think. <laughs>